Thank you. Thank you very, very much. What a wonderful night this has been, and I thank the Lord always for the music in our church. This has been a very special thing tonight. How many people are up here, Larry? 4,000? <laughs> and that's great. I, we had a former member, a member for many years here named Hayes Calicut, who said he had a dream one night that everyone was in the choir but him. <laughs> well, we're glad you're up there, choir, and we thank you for this, and thank you folks for being here. Uh, Stuart, when, when you did that thing about Christ in the Bible, uh, when that was broadcast across the nation, we had more requests for that than anything that's ever come from our church, and I Thank the Lord for that message and for you. Thank you, Karen, for being back, and we're so glad you're here. And Eva, thank you for 25 years of a wonderful life of service to the Lord. I, uh, I had a great thing from Darko as we were visiting just before the service. He said Eva is the first musician to share a witness with him, the first one he ever heard anyone say that their music had been dedicated to the Lord totally and had a great impact upon him, and I appreciate that very, very much. Well, tonight, let's look for a little while at 1 Thessalonians. We've gotten now to chapter 3 in 1 Thessalonians. Remember, this is a very, very important book in the Word because it's a letter to a church which is the closest church to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter was probably written some 40 years after Christ's death, and Paul had gone there and started this church, and it gives us insight into what the first churches were like about what God wanted the first churches to be like, about the relationship between the people in the first churches and what, it, what that's to be like. It's a wonderful letter of, of great fellowship. You remember that the gospel came our way. We talked about when the apostle was stopped by the Holy Spirit and the Spirit said, you don't go that way toward Ephesus, you go that way toward Philippi. And he went that way, our direction, toward Philippi. And that started the gospel in our direction, literally in history. And then he went from Philippi to Thessalonica, not very far away. Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia, just like Jackson is the capital of Mississippi. Macedonia was a Roman state, and, and, and uh, Thessalonica was the capital of that Roman state. Uh, trouble was there, just like they had had trouble in Ephesus when they shared the radical gospel of Christ. You know what was radical about the gospel of Christ? God loves you. God loves you and has paid for your sins and wants to give you eternal life. And that was such a radical idea in those days that religious people simply would not accept it. And they started all sorts of problems. Remember, he was driven out of, a, of a Philippi. You recall that they found out he was a Roman citizen. They had treated him illegally because he was a Roman citizen. He was supposed to have gotten a different kind of treatment, and they told him to slip quietly out of town. And Paul said, no, I'm not going unless you escort me. So he made those people who had illegally captured him, they, he had them to escort him out of town. And I told you about the football coach from Yale who said, if they ever run you off, get in front and act like you're, you're leading a parade. Well, Paul did that when he left Philippi and then went to Thessalonica found some very crude and hard people there who were jealous of how he was reaching so many people for Christ, and they started a riot. They accused him for the riot. They had him run out of town once again for the sake of the people that he was leaving there. He left not to cause trouble. He went on to Berea, and the Bible says this about the Bereans, that they were a more noble character than the Thessalonians. That's not saying much about the people at Thessalonica, but Paul loved that church at Thessalonica. He loved those people like he loved all the church. Now remember this about New Testament evangelism. Our foreign mission board has adopted this. Our international mission board has adopted this as a statement for the way we do evangelism. Evangelism has to result in church. And it is not New Testament evangelism if it does not result in church. The apostle never went around handing out four spiritual laws and patting people on the head and walking off and forgetting them. He started churches everywhere he went. He shared the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere he went, made sure they understood that, wrote them back in letters, made sure they understand their firmness and belief in Christ, and then also made sure that they understood that they were responsible as Christians, that there was something for them to do, that their life is to grow, they're to be the kind of people to bring other folks to Christ and other people to know God and to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is the need of Christians. And every Christian who is close to God needs the church. We need that church because it's a place where we're nurtured. 
I remember as a little boy, my parents didn't go to church, but church came to me. And they took me into their fellowship, and they loved me, and they led me to know Christ as Savior, and they discipled me. The Royal Ambassadors, one of the greatest discipleship for young people I know in teaching our commitment to missions and what it means. And I'll never forget what Sunday school and the Royal Ambassadors and the great people of that church meant to me because they were helping me to fill a need in my life. I needed to grow in Christ. I wasn't going to get that at home. And so they brought that to me and gave me that, and I appreciated that so very, very much. I'll have to admit to you, uh, they say confession is good for the soul, but it's bad for the reputation. But I'm going to make this confession anyway. This afternoon, I spent more time watching TV than I should have. And when I, usually my schedule is to... Uh, get up at 6 in the morning, get ready for these two services, and then to rest until about 3.30 or 4, and then, and then review the Sunday night notes. Now, preachers prepare for Sunday morning and repair for Sunday night. And that's what I, what I usually try to do, is to repair starting about 4 o'clock in the evening. But the baseball game was on. <laughs> and the fellow who was pitching in the baseball game is someone I baptized. Do you know Oral Hershiser? Uh, he was in San Antonio. Oral Hershiser is a is a fellow who kind of found himself in the fellowship of people who believed in him and loved him. Oral was pitching in the minor leagues for the San Antonio Dodgers when we were there. Uh, another Jackson couple who lived next door to him, Dr. and Mrs. Bert Strom, he was doing his intern work there. Dr. and Mrs. Strom witnessed to the Hershizers and brought them to our church, and they made their profession of faith and were baptized in our church in San Antonio. And they became very, very faithful members because they needed the fellowship. They needed to grow in the Lord, and they understood that. And it was there that Oral began to feel better about himself and maybe even to feel a sense of call in this baseball thing that God had given this as some way to bring God glory and not just Oral glory. And so he began to see his, his career in a different way. He went to, finally was called up. He stayed in the minor leagues longer than most people usually do. Usually you get discouraged and quit before old Hershiser did. But he began to feel this sense of calling in what he was doing. And the church was nurturing him. That church loved Oral so very much that when he went out to the Los Angeles Dodgers, he first was one of those guys who was a middle reliever, which means they didn't know when he was going to pitch. It was two hours earlier on, on the West Coast than it was in San Antonio. So these people got dishes so they could watch the game and usually stayed up until midnight hoping they could get to see him pitch every night. They were so glad when he became a starter. But he was a man who understood what it meant to be encouraged, to be encouraged by the people of a church, to be helped to find themselves in that, and when he went to Los Angeles, and one day his manager said to him, Oral, you've got what it takes to be a great pitcher. He had never thought of that before in his life. And when Tommy Lasorda spoke that word of encouragement to him, that's the day he literally became a great pitcher because he never believed it until then. Now, that's what the church does for us. It tells us our worth. It tells us that we are children of God. It gives us fellowship with each other. And he's saying the church is very, very important. And Paul wrote back such endearing letters to churches. Remember to the Philippians, he said, I thank my God on every remembrance of you. Why, those remembrances were Lydia, the wealthiest lady in town, becoming a Christian and starting the church in her home of that demented little fortune-telling girl that he witnessed to, and she was saved and, and healed of that illness that she had, of being cast into prison unjustly and singing praises to God at midnight, and the other prisoners heard them, and revival started in that jailhouse, and then being let out, and, and then coming on down to the next place in Thessalonica. He's writing them back and saying, this is how I feel about you. He said, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So beginning in chapter 3, he says, So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. He's saying that when we got to Athens, they went to Thessalonica, they went to Berea, and then they came to Athens. And when he was in Athens, he said, I couldn't take it any longer. I had to find out how you were doing. I had to hear from you. I knew there was persecution there. I knew they had lied about me. I had to find out how you were doing and how you were holding up in the faith. And so Paul did something he never did ever before. He stayed alone in a place. He always had someone with him before. He realized how much he needed his friends and how much he needed their encouragement and their help. And he'll say that even here. But he decided to, to just be alone in Athens for a few days 
while Timothy and Silas went to see how the people were doing in Thessalonica. said, We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. You know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that well, as you well, that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. He's caring so much about him. He says, I need you. I love you. He's talking about uh, their continual need for support. Christians always need their support. You never have a new baby born and throw it in the yard to see if it's going to live. It needs support. New babies in Christ need support. They need to be helped. And there's great love for him that Paul says in verses 1 through 4, I loved you, sent Timothy. He sent Timothy to establish them. That means to let them know that you know that you know Jesus Christ. One of the new things we give new Christians in our church is called a survival kit for the new Christians. One of my dearest friends worked for years writing that, and we helped him a little bit with that. And Ralph Neighbors came up with a thing called a survival kit for the new Christians. And it's designed most of all for new Christians to simply take their Bibles and do the lessons and fill in the blanks, and it's designed to let you know you can know that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be established in your faith. You don't have to doubt that you're saved. God's Word helps you know that you have eternal life and what you can do and what it means to pray and what it means to have a quiet time and how you can read God's Word and be blessed by it and not be bored by it. And so many things are important. He sent Timothy to establish them. He sent Timothy to encourage them. Now, the word encourage, it means to give courage, but it's an interesting word here. It's the word paraclete. Now, the word paraclete in the Greek is the very same word for the Holy Spirit. The word means someone to stand beside me. Someone is there to help me, to hold me up, to encourage me. I told a group of men not too long ago in my support group, I said, look, I, I want you fellows to know I don't ever want to be put on a pedestal as a preacher. I've noticed that that's dangerous. I've noticed that when you put preachers on a pedestal and they fall off, you don't catch them. I want to stand beside you so you can feel me leaning. I want you to know that I need you right there. And that's what this encourager is, is one who stands beside, one who's there to help brace, brace you up and hold you up there. And that's what the church is supposed to be. You know, the church is a group of people who are admitted in their weakness. We all admit that we're sinners. We don't say, look at me, I'm great. We in the church are better than other people. We say, we're the people who have admitted that we're sinners. I've often thought that Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12-step program is one of the greatest pictures of what church is supposed to be. It's a group of people who say, i got a problem, and I can't solve it, and I need God's help, and I need the help of other people who have the same problem who will encourage me, and I can encourage them, and we can help each other in this walk with the Lord. Well, that's exactly what the church is. It's people who say, i got a problem. I'm a sinner, and I can't stop it, and I need God's help to be forgiven of my sins. And I need the help of other sinners who have been forgiven by God so we can help each other and encourage each other. And that's what accountability groups and Sunday school classes and friends are for in the church were to encourage each other. And then he said something in verse 3 that is hard to take, but it's true. We're destined for suffering. There's going to be a cross in every Christian's life. And the Lord says, take up your cross daily and follow me. Christianity is not getting out of trouble. The Apostle Paul had all the trouble he had because he was a Christian, not, not getting out of it. And this is a suffering that comes. God gets great glory in that, and there is a cross of discipleship in all of our, on all of our paths. And then in verses 5 through 8, Paul talks about his need for friends. In verse 5, he said, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid in some way that the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. He's talking about his need in friends. He said, I had to know. I had to know how you were doing. I had to know how things were going in your life. I had to get a report on that. And Timothy came back with a report. And it was a good report. When I was reading this, I thought about the little boy who brought his report card home. And it wasn't outstanding. 
And he said, Dad, here's my report card, and here's one of yours. <laughs> I heard about the little boy who gave his report card to his father, and his, his dad was looking at it. He said, Daddy, do you think it's environment or heredity? <laughs> But they gave a good report. They had a good report card that Timothy brought back about them and how they were doing and how their life was growing. And Paul is saying in these verses, how you feel about me is very important. How you feel about me is very important. Very few of us will, will, will talk about that, will we? I, I used to have a friend who said, criticism doesn't bother me. When, I, when people start telling me what they say, what they want to say about me, I say, look, what you think about me is none of my business. Well, I, I, that's clever, but I don't think any of us can really live that way. We are concerned about what other people think of us. And the apostle is saying, I'm very concerned. They had gossiped about Paul in Thessalonica. They had slandered him. They had slandered his motives. They had slandered his teachings. They had said that he was crazy. They said that even the religious people who are respected religious people would not have much to do with him. They said all these kind of things, and he was concerned about how they felt about him because that would affect how they felt about the message that he preached. And he was saying, I'm very concerned about how you feel about me. And this letter reflects in so many wonderful ways that how important Christian relationship is. How, how we relate to each other and how vital that is and, and what it means and what it means to have this kind of faith. You know, the people that I really am impressed with are the people that I, that I call the IBMs. Uh, when you're a minister and you're trying to reach people, you're always concerned about the people who just moved to town. I've been moved, IBMs. And when people have been moved, it's a kind of crucial time in their life. It can be difficult. I know as a, as a little boy, my dad moved around a lot. I, I moved my children around a lot in the ministry, and, and I was always sensitive to what that's like because I've been the new kid in school on a lot of occasions, and that is not easy. And the people who try to be your friends the first day of school usually are not going to be your best friends. They're going to get you into trouble if you're not careful. I learned that pretty quickly too. And, and I found that there are some people that when they've been moved, and they become new to a community, they make a beeline for the church. And they don't shop for two hours or two years, I mean, and look around and say, I'm going to find something that's just right for me. They find, they find a church and they join the church and they get into a Sunday school and they make friends and they establish those relationships. And as they do that, uh, this is a real wonderful thing. You see them becoming part of your community and, and their lives are enriched by that. They're, they're the people who have found a relationship in the Lord. And verse 8 is, a, is a, a, great, a great statement. It says, How can we thank God enough for you? For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Verse 8 says, For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. Paul says, My life is in the well-being of others. If you want to see people who are rich in spirit... If you want to meet people who make more difference in their world than anyone else, find someone like this whose life is in the lives of others, who live to help others live, who people find their life in the well-being of other people. And then the last several verses say, Your joy is my joy. Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. We thank God for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. Uh, your joy is our joy, and that's what the church is. You know, the apostle could have said, I'm so proud of my work in Thessalonica. I'm so proud I came there. There wasn't anything there. There wasn't even a church. They hadn't even heard of Jesus Christ. And I preached the gospel. And I started this church. And this church became stronger and stronger. And these people became stronger. And even though they had to, I was gone and they couldn't be there, they kept growing and the ministry was good. And I am so proud of this church in Thessalonica. He never said that. He said, I thank God for you. I thank God for what he's done in you. I thank God for his work in you. I thank God for his ministry in you at Thessalonica. And it is God's work. It is God's ministry. The Bible said it is God who adds to the church. It is God who helps us grow. It is the Lord God who makes all this happen. Thanks to God, he is the source of it all. But Paul, in writing these letters, when he wrote to the people in Rome, he closed that letter by naming 26 people 
What a picture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in those names. Every race is recognized there. Somebody from every race. Somebody from every background. Somebody from many, many different nations. Uh, he, he recognized 26 different people and called their names as he closed out the letter to the Romans. He said to the Philippians, I thank God every time I think of you. To these people he said, you are my joy and you are my crown. And it brings to mind a thing I learned several years ago that someone sent me through the mail that meant a great deal. He said, I'm part of all whom I have met. So friend of me, you're a wholesome part. Our precious visits lingering with me yet are flowers in the garden of my heart. Your smile like violets, sweet beyond compare. Your words, carnations, cheering me on my way. Your deeds like roses, rich with perfume rare, bring faith and hope and love to every day. So friend of me, though you may be far away, between us may stretch mountain, plain, and sea. Yet by my side you walk and talk each day because you are a precious part of me. The Lord never intended evangelism not to result in church. And he's saying that church is very, very important to us because we're part of each other and we help each other and we love each other because we've been loved by the glory of God. Let's bow in prayer, shall we? Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the sweet experience of the fellowship of your church. And I pray you'll help us always to be people who because we have been loved, will be loving. Because we have been forgiven, will be forgiving. Because we have been accepted, we'll be accepting. Because we've been loved so very much, we'll reflect the life of Jesus Christ in the world around us and especially in this fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, on this very special night, the exciting thought is that there may be someone here who's going to make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. The exciting thought is that there may be someone here who's going to say, I want to be a part of this church, and how that would thrill us to have you come and join us. Maybe God has called you to a special task. God is calling people young and old to do things for him in a full-time way now, and what an exciting thing it is to get to do that. I, I don't know what God would have you do, but I think you do. And I pray you'll do it. Let's stand now and sing and you come and do God's will.